The hybrid workforce is here to stay, and it requires real-time visibility, control, and rapid response of every endpoint, whether it's in the office or home. Tanium offers an endpoint management and security platform built for the most demanding IT environments. Many of the world's largest and most sophisticated organizations, including nearly half of the Fortune 100, rely on Tanium to deliver unmatched endpoint visibility and control. Whether you're preparing for zero trust or protecting your network from supply chain risk, Tanium empowers technology leaders to achieve greater agility, efficiency, and confidence. Learn more at securityweekly.com forward slash Tanium. When it comes to your network, visibility is imperative because you can't secure what you can't see. Riverbed's network performance management solution gives you 100% network visibility 100% of the time. Now you can resolve performance issues and security threats up to 90% faster and reduce response time, damage, and cost spent on remediation and containment efforts. Connect with Riverbed today and learn how their NPM solution can protect your network by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash Riverbed. Did you know that 81% of data breaches are caused by weak password security? Keeper Security's easy-to-use password manager platform keeps your passwords safe, easy to share, and out of reach of cyber criminals. Keeper is the leading cybersecurity platform for preventing password-related data breaches and cyber threats. Check out Keeper and get a free three-year Keeper password manager solution when you take a demo of Keeper for Business. Learn more at securityweekly.com forward slash Keeper Security. And welcome back to Enterprise Security Weekly. Join us for our next live webcast on December 2nd to see what's under the XDR hood. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash webcasts to save your seat. Don't forget to check out our library of on-demand webcasts and technical trainings at securityweekly.com forward slash on-demand. Just wrapped up one today, actually, uh, that was uh, really, really good. It was on the OWASP top 10 with uh, folks from Contrast Security. So by this time tomorrow, probably you should be able to check out that one on demand. And uh, figuring out what XDR is, is something I'm looking forward to also on that one. For our next interview, Nick Leghorn joins us today to talk about building risk-based security programs that actually work. Uh, he is the Director of Application Security at the New York Times and has a really interesting background, has worked uh, for DHS, quantifying terrorism risks and identifying mitigations, uh, worked for Rackspace, Shortel, Mitel, and Indeed, improving infrastructure security as well as processes. Welcome to the show, Nick. Thanks. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, so... Um, you know, very, very interesting background. Interested uh, to hear how you got into uh, security and, and like that DHS role is is pretty interesting, Nick. Yeah, I, I mean, I've, I've been in uh, in in the security space, uh, I want to say since at least I was in high school. Like I, um, back when I was in, in high school, a bunch of friends and I would like, uh, we had our own PHP BB based uh, message boards and our, our Saturdays were basically trying to, uh, annoy each other the most with how much damage we can do to each other's stuff. Uh, and so um, figuring out very quickly attack and defense, how do you set up things correctly, uh, ways to, to understand uh, backdoors into systems, it, it's it's a lot of fun. Um, but uh, having the structure around that, I mean, that attack and defense is really cool, but I, I really get into the structure around it. Like, how do you protect a thing from a systematic perspective? What are the the weak points that you can determine in, in a process and in a system? And uh, and how do you build a uh, process and procedure around that is, is kind of what I, I really get interested in, which led me towards uh, more of the risk management system. Uh, how do you quantify what risk is? How do you figure out what the important components are in a system that you need to protect? Um, and that got me into a degree in risk management and then uh, working for as a contractor for DHS for a while doing terrorism risk assessment, um, which sounds really cool and really interesting till you realize that you're in a windowless room eight hours a day, uh, just staring at a computer with no internet access, wearing a very stuffy suit. And that's uh, it's going to be a hard pass for me. So I uh, moved on, <laughs> uh, went to work for Rackspace hosting and a couple others. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm sure interesting experience, though, you know, all the same. But, um, yeah, definitely PHP, PHP BB had a few CVEs, if I recall. Just one or two. It made it uh, made it very interesting from both perspectives. Uh, it, it's uh, And it's interesting, like, it's not just 
uh, the software that you're running on top of it, but the system underneath and making sure that the hosting provider yeah. you're using is secure and, and all those layers that, that go on top of it. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's fun. It's a lot of fun when it's a live fire exercise with, my, with your friends. And with your own stuff that you own, so that's actually very similar to how I, I developed a lot of my skills before I got into the uh, the industry uh, formally, is just running my own stuff. Just uh, got a domain, decided to run my own email and put it out on the public internet, and you're going to be forced to learn a whole bunch about security. I go back, um, I, I graduated from Penn State, uh, and I go back and, and I talk at uh, the IST college every so often, and that's my number one recommendation to people getting into the industry is just set something up. Like, hey, it's going to get attacked pretty much the second it's on the internet. Like, That's a guarantee is you're, you're just going to have that happen. Um, and being able to understand and do the forensics on it yourself and figure out what happened and better secure it, uh, it, it really does make you a, a better engineer and a better well-rounded security engineer just to understand what's going on and, and have that experience under your belt. Yeah, definitely. And you know, getting into, I don't know if you could give us like a short primer and risk-based security. You know, I know a lot, a, a lot of folks, uh, a lot of organizations I've seen, you know, just kind of like the, you know, the the incident or, or you know, fire-based approach to, uh, <laughs> to addressing security where you just kind of jump from one incident to the next or, you know, it's very operationally focused uh, uh, security departments uh, where, where, Everybody owns a tool or something like that, you know. They and that tool drives their kind of day to day um, tasks. You know, they're very tactically focused. There's not a whole lot of strategy there. So, um, yeah, if, yeah, if you could give us just kind of a, a you know baseline of of you know wh what a risk based approach looks like. I, I mean, that's uh, in my career. That's probably the scariest moment is when I moved from like individual contributor to a manager role, and all of a sudden you're responsible for things. Like people ask you, okay, what's your plan? Like, what's what are you going to do, and how are we going to do this? And um, I, I feel like a lot of people run into, uh, or they run to like the OWASP top ten and and CIS twenty, and and they just go for that checklist. And it's a it's a great starting point for. Uh, you know, implementing security within the company and, and doing those sort of things. And then it eventually morphs into this, like you're talking about firefighting of just uh, one incident comes up and it's whatever's on the uh, the CEO's top of mind or whatever the last thing he heard about on a podcast was that he got really interested in uh, and just becomes super reactive. Um, and it, it that'll, that kind of works, but it, it doesn't really get you the the risk reduction you're looking for. Like at the end of the day, that's how we're we're running into these problems these days, where companies are putting a lot of time and effort into a security program, and they're they're trying to do the right thing, and they're spending a lot of money on it. But at the end of the day, we're not really getting a lot of security out of it. Uh, we're, you still have these problems. There's still these systems out there that are that are uh, uh, super problematic, um, and often we're focusing on stuff that really doesn't make sense, like stuff that. Uh, we're, we're not getting the most bang for a buck uh, out of what we're trying to do. And so um, when I started building security programs and, and starting being responsible for, for implementation of, of uh, parts of a security program or putting it together, um, I just went back to my old uh, risk management ba background and uh, started thinking about, okay, so we have, we have assets, we have things, we have stuff we care about. Um, if you're working for for uh, a company like uh, a phone company, you might uh, intuitively understand that you know your assets are uh, confidential off calls, maybe the uh, client list that you have, access to your systems, not spoofing things. Um, like there are certain um, components that are, are super critical in that area. Uh, and then it, it really becomes an exercise in figuring out, okay, these are the keys to the castle. How do we protect the stuff around that? Um, and how do we prioritize those things so that we're, we're spending our most effort trying to fix those problems that directly uh, reduce the likelihood of those things being compromised. Uh, and quite honestly, I mean, most of the time that means that we're deprioritizing stuff in other places, even when that's um, maybe we don't have a complete asset inventory. But is that really important uh, if, you know, we have, uh, uh, I don't know, port 33 uh, uh, SQL ports open to the internet, right? Maybe maybe there are some things we need to do first before we get to CIS control number one. So, so, so Jeff, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Katie. 
I have a question related to that because you just alluded to prioritization and focusing on the things that matter most. But I think a lot of people still get risk management wrong. I think there's a misconception about what it means in terms of cybersecurity. So what would you say somebody with a formal education in risk management who's been doing it a long time, what would you say are the main misconceptions? What are companies still getting wrong as it relates to cyber? I think um, I think the biggest thing that people still uh, have trouble with is the concept that risk is okay. Um, there's there's a continuum, right? It, risk is a cybersecurity is a spectrum. Uh, it, you can either be super secure and very slow to produce things, or you can be super insecure and get things out the door really fast. And being anywhere on that spectrum is okay. It's a valid perspective and a valid place to be. Uh, and really, the challenge is making sure that the business understands what it means to be there, uh, how risky it is to be at that particular location, or or that they are there to begin with. Uh, a lot of companies um, want to be super secure, and they, they, they pay lip service to wanting to do all these, uh, to be the most secure, be as, as secure as a bank, that sort of stuff. But they don't understand that you're trading off um, uh, quicker time to market for things or faster development cycles. Uh, and then when they start to understand that, it that's where the fight starts to happen is they're wanting to be super secure and wanting to do things really fast at the same time. Uh, and that's just two competing priorities that really aren't, uh, aren't able to be resolved uh, sufficiently together. So it's it's uh, instead of fighting them against each other, it's really understanding that there's a balance between the two. Uh, and you're going to have to trade off some things for some other things. Um, my job, uh, as I see it, is primarily, um, I, I don't necessarily, I don't know if my boss would appreciate me saying that I don't necessarily fix things, but I don't necessarily fix things. Uh, my job is to help people understand what the issues are, what that means if they fix it, uh, and what it means if they don't fix it. I, I really help, uh, I help the business make health, I help the business choose healthy risks. Uh, and that's that's really what my perspective is on things. And do you and think that, when, because I, I agree with you, but do you think that when uh, somebody in security is explaining that to a business person who doesn't necessarily understand that, they certainly understand risk from different points of view, but, but from a cybersecurity point of view, they might not understand it. Do you think that there's the the concern that maybe, like you said, your boss may not appreciate the notion that you don't fix things. Do you think that most business executives would say, well, yeah, you're in security, fix things before we get breached? Or do you think there has to be another layer in there somewhere? I think, um, so I gave a talk about this a couple of years ago uh, called the not my responsibility mindset um, that talked a little bit more about what you're, what you're knocking on, uh, which is really that security doesn't, security isn't actually responsible for the security of the company, right? Uh, ultimately, the security of the company is the responsibility of the C-level, the, the CEO. Uh, it's their responsibility right. to do things. And the security team is there to support and help and uh, visualize and make sure that we're doing the right thing and provide advice. Um, and, and what that means at the end of the day is... Um, it, Security engineers, to your point, want to fix things. They want to solve these problems. We we want to be responsible. We feel responsible for the security of the company, but it's not really our job. Like if if we were actually responsible for the security of the company in, in an engineering organization, for example, um, then the security team would be responsible for like validating every push that we do to, to, to production. Like we'd be responsible for, for all the QA in the company. Uh, and when you start laying out that, okay, if you want to make me responsible for that, that means I own QA, I own dev, I own these components, all these things need to report to us instead of reporting to other places. Then they start to understand that, oh yeah, you, you guys don't actually do that. Uh, and then that starts more of a larger negotiation of, okay, so how, how do we fit in with this? How do we uh, interact with these teams to improve security and improve visualization? How do we make this uh, a functioning process? And that's that's the golden part of risk management for for uh, larger organizations is um, risk management is all about um, 
I was an EMT for a while, right? And I we have this uh, concept called informed consent, that if you're going to give a patient a medication, you need to make sure they understand what that means and uh, that there are side effects or this is going to do things. Um, our, our goal as security engineers is to make sure that the business has informed consent when they're doing things with a security aspect. Uh, that if we're introducing new tooling or if we're pushing out new code that uh, has known vulnerabilities in it, that they give informed consent, that it's uh, we're making helping them understand what that means and and uh, what the trade-offs are so we can have that higher level conversation rather than getting stuck in this vulnerability needs to be remediated within X number of days, which is a uh, um, uh, makes sense as a starting point, but like that has to be the starting point of a negotiation that can't ever be uh, a hard and fast thing that you set that is uh, uh, immutable, never able to be changed. And so now you're you're at a company that's kind of a big target for a lot of people. The media has become a political topic for whatever reason. We won't get into that right now, but the media has become this very contentious space over the past few years. So are you seeing you need to do things differently from a risk perspective? I mean, obviously, technologically, there have to be some changes as well. But from a risk perspective, are you looking at it differently? Are you managing it differently? Are you communicating up, down, and sideways differently about risk? When uh, when, I, when I, I took this job, uh, I joked with my wife that um, you know back at uh, back at previous jobs, we'd think about threat actors and we'd talk about nation state actors as oh, wouldn't that be funny if a nation state actor came up or a little old us? Like no one's ever going to do that. Ha ha ha! And we go off to, to talk about you know more likely things. Uh, but at, at the times, that's a thing. Like that's uh, a, an entire possibility that like nation state actors are, are trying to target us. And so it's definitely a different threat landscape. Uh, from from stuff we've done before, but it's it's the same approach. To be honest, um, really, it's it's a the the point of the security team is to identify the assets that are critical and the components that are critical in the systems, uh, and to put up the the right level of security around that. Um, I, I tell my my folks that like we can't secure a, a bankrupt business. Uh, that's not ever that's not ever going to work. Uh, and so there has to be some level of speed to market. There has to be some level of um, getting things out the door um, that we need to encourage and we need to, to make sure that we're supporting the business in that while we're still implementing appropriate security measures. Uh, and uh, I think there's uh, there's an article that we put out, uh, I want to say a couple months ago, uh, where we talked about, like, for example, with the elections that just happened, uh, the New York Times took a, a risk-based approach to uh, reliability and security and engineering for specifically our elections uh, components. There's there's a lot of stuff that goes into managing those uh, those components and and getting that stuff out the door. And and you can imagine that uh, if there's so much as a blip on on the election stuff, uh, that it can cause a ripple effect uh, in in certain aspects. Uh, so making sure that the confidentiality or and the integrity and the availability of those systems are are sacrosanct is uh, super important. Uh, but at the same time, we have to secure everything else in the organization as well. And so um, being able to identify what critical components uh, support those systems and support that mission and being able to test and secure those systems specifically and understanding to what extent we need to do that for different components and different levels um, is really a great example of how we we did risk management well. Uh, we we had that discussion with the business of what is the component that we care about the most and how much time do we put into this or not, um, and being able to to articulate that uh, trade off between getting things out the door quickly versus um, putting a lot of security effort into it. So, do you have any tips? You know, kind of going back. Um, well, you know, also based on on what you just finished saying there. Um, you know, the, the, the discipline and the focus that you need, you know, to emphasize certain things, to emphasize others once you've determined, you know, the levels of risk and, and where you're going to prioritize things. Um, you know, how, how do you address, you know, those squirrel moments when upper management, you know, sees something and, and they get excited about it? And it's not you already know that that's not something we're going to do. We're not going to spend a whole bunch of time worrying about that. How, how do you. I guess assuage their fears or, or convince them, you know, that um, it's not a good place to spend 
uh, time and effort. So that there's uh, not only is that a concern, but also uh, there's there's moments when you're going to have like the black swan event where it's in an area that you didn't expect uh, to see an issue pop up and and you deprioritized it, but all of a sudden it pops up again. Um, you're you're never going to have um, even in areas where you've reduced the risk significantly, like it's never going to be zero. You're never going to have a zero percent chance of anything. Um, so it's always going to potentially pop up somewhere. Um, and so those are moments where it it's again down to having that conversation. Like it it does require a bit of a, a bit of salesmanship and a bit of a cool head uh, to have that conversation with the business and say, you know, we made these decisions. We looked at the uh, at the landscape. We said that this was the thing that we cared about the most. And we made these decisions based on the environment that we were talking about then. And if we want to make different decisions, we can totally do that. That is entirely possible that we can make different decisions. Uh, we've got new information now, uh, it, not uh, dis, not discouraging or disparaging uh, the whatever article that the, the C-suite read or new information they got. Um, but the important part at that point is to, to put it into context. So amongst all the other stuff that we have, amongst all the other decisions that we've made, does that new piece of information change our approach to things? Is that something that uh, necessitates us making different decisions? Um, and part of having a good risk management program and, and actually operating it effectively is being able to be a little flexible. Uh, that it's it, you're going to have different decisions at different times of even times of the year of what you're going to focus on, uh, and and not we talk about like containers being cattle not cats, right? We talk about um, virtualized services being something you just throw away and and spin up again, um, and to some extent, like I think our our approach to our security program needs to have a similar approach. That if if it's not working, we can't be married to what we decided on last week. We need to be able to uh, to stick and move. We need to be able to to float with the new information and and change our program to meet the the evolving standards and the evolving needs. Uh, and so similarly, we need to be able to, uh, when this kind of new information comes in, um, be open to the possibility that it might change. Yeah, salesmanship uh, is definitely a theme that comes up over and over. You know, the, the ability to, uh, you know, convince your management, you know, convince other other teams, other departments, you know, that, that um, you know that that it makes sense to go in the direction that that you're going. You know, I think I think people uh, sometimes discount that. You know, that combined with not being, you know, not viewing every hill as a hill to die on. You know, and and being married to to different ideas and things like that. You know, I think are are, are two things that uh, I've personally seen contribute to the downfall of security being taken seriously or or being listened to. You know, and uh, to the point to where they're they're not invited to certain meetings anymore. And I would think with the with the speed of development at New York Times, you know, New York Times is, you know, looks more and more like a software company. You know, some of these stories that come out have these really elaborate visualizations and and things like that uh, baked into them. You know, so I, I wonder how um, how you deal with that as well. You know, how how you deal with that that component that need for for speed you know to be able to uh, support the business you know with those uh, short timelines you know that they they must have in getting some of the software out yeah no it's it definitely feels a lot more like a, a startupy uh, uh, engineering company than it does uh, a media company for times and and I I suppose that's especially true because I'm I'm in the the business side of it and not necessarily the journalism side um, and so I deal mainly with engineers and and those kind of folks. But um, it, it, coming from Indeed, coming from other engineering orgs, it doesn't feel that different. Like it, it's still a very um, there's a lot of uh, innovation that's encouraged. There's a lot of uh, trying new things and and doing stuff at scale that I haven't seen in other places. And it's um, it's really quite exciting to see all that stuff come together. And uh, we we don't want to discourage any of that stuff. We want to be able to encourage uh, people to to do new things and try new stuff and put put out new ideas. Um, it, it's uh, it's a company where um, 
I, I, I find it pretty funny that like it's, it's it was the old gray lady. Like it was the last uh, one of the last major newspapers, if not the last, to go from black and white and grayscale to color photos in in print. And it was one of the first companies, if not the first, to have an online newspaper presence. Uh, and it's it's uh, just accelerating in how much effort and how much uh, engineering effort is going into creating a really digital first experience for for journalism. Uh, and so our job as a security team is to to help encourage that, to make sure that we're we're helping the business put out the best story and put out the the most um, uh, put out the story in the best format possible and and in the best way possible and really tell that story um, and and encourage engineering teams to to support that in, in every way they can, um, but still maintaining the integrity and, and the confidentiality and, and the availability of the paper as well. Uh, and so it's really just going back to basics of building a good risk-based program and understanding what are the actual components that we care about that that need to be super secure, uh, building good templatized applications, making sure that you've got a paved road for, for deployment processes, like having good basics, having good fundamentals, and then for the stuff that comes up that uh, is new or interesting, just making sure that you understand what are the assets we really care about. Do a good threat model, make sure you understand what uh, what you're really protecting and, and what's changing and, and be able to uh, to provide good uh, good recommendations for how to secure it otherwise. Yeah, I think I think a lot of people don't realize, uh, you know, since New York Times has kind of rebooted themselves as a digital media company, you know, how, how many different uh, uh, lines of revenue there are. You know, like I, I think I pay New York Times like, the base subscription plus something extra for the food app and then something extra for the crosswords app. <laughs> like, you know, there, there's, uh, you know, like some of those, you know, not, not a really big, uh, you know, need for security there beyond, you know, just the managing the, the user and, and their payments and, you know, which I, I'm sure there's some kind of common back end on that. You're not rebuilding things from scratch uh, for, for each of these apps and their content. And we just launched. Uh, I think Wirecutter just went uh, digital subscription yeah. as well. Uh, and and yeah, we're we're just. Uh, uh, I'm not going to comment on the uh, uh, inner workings and the back ends, but um, sure. it, it is uh, an interesting. Um, it's it's at sometimes it's an interesting uh, startupy culture, but there's a lot of also uh, legacy systems that we're supporting and and stuff that. Uh, has been around for ages that we're 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 still making sure is is secure and running and um, it's an interesting challenge. Yeah, I'm, I'm I've been a big wire cutter fan since uh, before the acquisition. Actually, uh, they have informed many of my purchases. <laughs> Mine as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely uh, a good alternative to stuff like Consumer Reports, which, which I still use for other things. Um, so as we 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 kind of wrap up here. Any useful lessons from the aviation industry that that InfoSec could benefit from, in your opinion? I I just gave a talk uh, uh, last week, two weeks ago, at the Lone Star Application Security Conference, um, talking about policies and how we've done them terribly so far. Um, so the FAA um, 91103105, um, one of those rules uh, is the pre-flight requirements. Um, and it says uh, a pilot must be informed of like, or must be aware of all aspects of the trip and the, uh, the regulations around it before they take off, right? Um, which means as a result, if you've ever been standing at a, a, a gate before it takes off, uh, you'll hear the printer going in the background that's printing up basically the Bible. Uh, as as you're standing there, that has every line of everything they could possibly need for every weather update and air traffic control routing and everything that you can possibly want. Um, and the result is because there's everything, uh, if everything is important, nothing is important, right? So the things that actually matter get lost uh, and you aren't able to find them easily. Uh, and so the FAA uh, released a, an advisory circular earlier this year talking about this problem that really the the products they have aren't designed to actually um, give people the information they need in a timely manner um, and and they're they're going to start revamping them and, and working on better pro better ways to do it um, and security policies are kind of the same thing that we try to throw the kitchen sink at stuff uh, and we're we're 
writing them uh, specifically for like legal uh, drivers and HR drivers, um, but we're not really focusing on uh, the people that actually read them, the, the engineers, the employees, um, those kind of folks. Uh, and so uh, in, in my talk, I talked a little bit about this and it's on my blog, uh, it's nickleckburn.com. Um, doing what we did to, to, to microservices and breaking stuff out is the same approach that we can do to policies. Just make them bite-sized chunks, make it easily readable and digestible and, and really breaking it up in, from this giant legalese document into more digestible, readable chunks uh, is a, a really good way to make sure that people actually understand what's in the security policy and are able to actually use it. Because uh, having a good a good baseline understanding of what you're requiring in policies means that maybe people will actually follow them. Uh, so uh, I think that's that's the lesson I'm taking away this year from aviation is um, don't make things unreadable messes uh, and people might actually follow the policy. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you had such a concise answer there. I had, I had no idea that you had just given that talk. <laughs> that's great. It's pretty cool. All right, Nick, uh, thanks so much for joining us on Enterprise Security Weekly today. It's Appreciate it. And I'll be uh, looking forward to speaking at uh, Security Weekly Unlocked in a couple of weeks. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you for mentioning that. Uh, I was uh, reminded to mention something about that. But yeah, uh, good having you speaking there and uh, look forward to that as well. Uh, we'll be physically down there. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to be in person at, at uh, conferences again. It's going to be a lot of fun. Awesome. All right, everybody, uh, we'll be right back in a few moments with the weekly enterprise news. <laughs> 